invite a party of chaos to run your country. And then you find yourself in chaos. Some of the chaos is funny because it's so absurd. And some of it is highly dangerous. But that's where we're, we're at. Welcome to the Wigan Sessions. I'm Addison Wigan. With me, I have James Howard Kunstler. Good friend, actually. For how long? How long has it been? It's been like 12 years or something. Yeah, I I got invited to the first Agora conference in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, I, I, I know a number of people in the gang. Yeah. All right. So... So that's our intro, and we go from here. All right. But you know what? Some of the things you bring up, I am, uh, I literally called uh, Judd, who is helping us put this together. And I'm like, and I, can I call you Jim? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Jim. Do I look that formal? <laughs> no. No, what I'm saying is uh, you put things in a way that I wish that I could put them. Well, you're thank you. You're a wordsmith for one thing, but you're also like crack on about a lot of the things that are, are going on in our in our culture that nobody gives a shit about. Well, that's uh, uh, in part because, uh, maybe largely because we have become a culture in which anything goes and nothing matters. And, you know, when that's the case, you know, there, there are no consequences for anything. Uh, you know, people are never held responsible for the, for the things they do and the crimes they commit. And, uh, you know, a lot of people end up being persecuted who don't deserve it. And uh, that's where we're at now. So how does that work? <laughs> how does it work? Well, yeah, uh, your face. let me let me start with uh, Nina Jankowicz. Let's go. Yeah. Nina, Jan- Nina Jankowicz. I mean, can you imagine a more laughable episode of uh, but was offic- it real? official policy was idiocy? An actual thing. Pardon? Do you think that was actually an effort to launch? I, I, I re- to really launch a, cens- a censorship arm of Homeland Security? Yeah. Well, if, if it wasn't. What were they doing? Trying to humiliate themselves by making an unbelievably stupid move? I mean, either they were sincere about opening a, uh, a censorship bureau in Homeland Security, or they were looking to delegitimize and discredit themselves and make themselves look like idiots, because that's exactly what happened. I mean, how could you, how could you doubt that? They so were you would say the last. <laughs> Let's talk about that, though. Uh-huh. I, I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a look, what kind of a, uh, a, a juke move, you know, a zigzag kind of fake out move would that be to create this whole idiotic, stupid thing with this clownish commissioner or whatever her title was, you know, singing Mary Poppins songs about uh, uh, about misinformation. That's my uh, point. And- it's like, how do you get to that point? Well, you you invite a party of chaos to run your country and then you find yourself in chaos. Some of the chaos is funny because it's so absurd and some of it is highly dangerous. Uh, And, uh, you know, but that's where we're we're at, where we're we're being uh, our country is being run by a party that wants seems to appears to want to destroy our institutions, our economy and our uh, social cohesion. All right. So when I first met you, we were talking about the long emergency. Yeah. You, you would come to Vancouver and we would talk about that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and your, your proposition at that point seemed like um, it, it might be a little, little way off. You were alarmist at the point, right? A little yeah. bit, right? Well, there, look, there were certain things that were underway. There were trends that were underway that were kind of unmistakable. And uh, it looked like uh, it was going to take a while for them to unwind. And that indeed is what happened. I preceded the long emergency by writing three books about the fiasco of suburbia and what yeah, we were going to yeah, do yeah. about it. I like that one. So we'll dig into that in a minute. 
All right. But uh, my point being that, you know, you notice things that were underway, like the relationship between our oil predicament and the way we had arranged everyday life on the landscape of North America and the uh, probability that it had poor prospects for continuing the way it was designed to run. And, you know, now, now we're at that stage with really not just suburbia, but the giant metroplex cities too are probably going to be in a great deal of trouble. Uh, that's a whole other folder of uh, ideas that you may not want to get into. No, I actually I want to get into them in the just the outlay of of the conversation we're we're going to have. Like, like uh, I think at one point you had called it the the worst allocation of human capital. Uh, yeah, the the big yeah, the greatest mis that, misallocation, the, the greatest yeah. misallocation of, of capital. Since, uh, uh, in, since in, the end of the war, right? No, since the, the greatest of misallocation of resources in the history of the world. <laughs> okay. A little different. So, it, no, I mean, it happened since 1945. Not really. It started about 1920. Explain that because I think that's... Okay, well, I'll, I'll explain it by... Let me... Let me First, um, tell the, your listeners what my new theory of history is, uh, which is very brief. Um, uh, things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time. That's it. Okay, they seem like a good idea at the time. World War I seemed like a good idea at the time to the military people whose model of warfare was the Franco-Prussian War. Okay, but things had changed. Uh, they didn't ride off gloriously on uh, in, in cavalry formations and spend the summer campaigning and then come home. Uh, they instead spent uh, four years in the slaughter of the trenches. So World War I wasn't a very good idea. After World War I, uh, we had this idea in America that we should, uh, we got the Model T Ford and the assembly line method of, of, uh, of uh, making them and we had all of this cheap real estate outside the cities because this was a big country that had not been settled all that long. And uh, it was a lot of open land. And we decided, hey, we've got these cars now. And we've also got the trains and the trolleys. Let's, let's develop all the periphery of the cities. And, and it'll be great because you can lead a country life close to the city and then just drive into the city to do your thing. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. And we did it. Um, to a large extent, it drove the prosperity of the 1920s in America, the whole uh, dynamic of, you know, these new inventions of the automobile and, uh, you know, the radio and uh, all that stuff. But, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, that, that uh, boom came to an end in 1929. And then we had about 15 years of depression and war. And we came back from the war in 1945 and resumed the suburban project with a vengeance. It still seemed like a good idea at the time. Plus, you know, we were in a great situation in the catbird seat all over the world. And uh, we had the our industrial infrastructure remained intact and everybody else's was broken. So we were able to sell people anything and lend them the money to do it. And we ended up with this tremendous industrial surge in the 1950s and 60s. And that, that enabled the suburban expansion to continue and to elaborate itself. But you know, you go through the, you go through the decades and then we find ourselves at the end of the 20th century, all of a sudden uh, in a quandary with petroleum, you know, where it's called the peak oil story. And we're beginning to understand that the oil industry and the oil markets are going to destabilize. And when they do, it's going to make uh, our living arrangements very difficult. And that's exactly what happened um, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, we undertook a rescue operation called the Shale Oil Mir Miracle, which many, if not most Americans, don't understand but I can explain it. And uh, now the shale oil miracle is pretty much uh, coming to an end, winding down, and we're gonna be back where we started, uh, you know, having, being short of oil. Uh, in fact, 
there are so many dynamics of failure now underway in the economy and in the global economy that uh, the likelihood is that um, the wheels are really going to come off in a major way uh, in the next 18 months. And we are going to be in the heart of the, this thing I call the long emergency, which is going to be a, a crack up of industrial technological industrial societies. But what what does that mean? Um, like, if you put it in context of the uh, people are saying, "Oh, well, now the zeitgeist is moving to China, or or we're going to move to I don't know some kind of polarized world where the reserve currency." Uh, well, is, all these things are in flux, Addison. The yeah, the, the whole that's the whole capital. Saying. The whole capital and currency uh, issue is in flux. I mean, we we have reason to believe that a lot of the, the stuff that's out there that we consider to, that we call capital is not really there. You know, it, they're simply debts and obligations that parties owe to one another. And if they don't get paid, then the the wealth or the money or the capital will not be there. And of course, that will affect currencies. So that whole thing's unsettled. We don't know yet whether the public of Western civilization will accept digital currencies and all the losses of freedom that that uh, implies. Um, the geopolitical uh, chess game out there of uh, who exerts the most influence in the world is completely up in the air at this moment. What, you know, what we're seeing is kind of a rapid decline of American influence, partly due to our bungling, and uh, the rise of China and, and to some degree, Russia, the, the, the country that we're trying desperately to disable. Uh, although, you know, I have my own uh, ideas about China and their ability to continue doing what they're doing. I, uh, it's my opinion that they're in at least as much trouble as we are because of their relationship with the oil markets in the world. And, um, uh, you know, so the, the, the world is in a process of rearranging its its uh, ways of doing things, getting things and being things. And it's very distressing. It's hard to see where things might go. We always have to understand that there are, you know, Mr. Rumsfeld's old unknown unknowns out there, or as Taleb calls them, the black swans, you know. And also, uh, you know, life tends to be nonlinear. The universe tends to produce nonlinear phenomena and a lot of surprises happen. The final thing is that God is a prankster and, uh, you know, he likes to, uh, he likes to mess with us. Yeah. So your latest book is living with it. So, living in the long emergency. Yeah. Yeah. So what, like, what does that mean to somebody like me? Well, what it means to all of us is uh, the need to understand what the macro trends are and what it's telling us. You know, we're, we're unlikely to enter this uh, transhuman digitized nirvana of the WEF. Yeah, let's talk about that too, but keep going. <laughs> yeah, that's not likely to happen. What, what uh, reality is really telling us is that we've got to drastically downscale our activities, the way we make things and the way we move things, the way we uh, sell things, the way we inhabit the landscape. All these things have to become more concentrated, smaller, finer, uh, and more local. And uh, anything that's organized at the giant scale is likely to fail whether it's a giant empire or a giant state university or a giant Ivy League university or a giant corporation, these things are all headed into failure. You know, the, the, the things and institutions and companies and endeavors that are going to survive are going to be the things that are smaller and more nimble. We're going to have tremendous problems with food uh, the North American economy is going to become much more internally focused as globalism withers, which it is doing very rapidly right now and unraveling all those economic relations that created this uh, kind of, uh, you know, final orgy of techno industrialism in the last 25 years. 
Uh, all those relationships are now breaking and the world's going to become a larger place again. And our economies are going to be much more domestically oriented. In America, what that means is that uh, uh, life is going to reorganize uh, around the inland waterway system of America, the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, the uh, Great Lakes, the canals that connect uh, New York to uh, the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Um, a lot of the West is going to become uh, depopulated because places like Phoenix and Houston uh, are not going to have enough water or, or be, uh, have enough of a meaningful relationship to food production. Uh, places like Los Angeles are going to be in trouble for uh, an even larger number of dynamic reasons, including ethnic conflict. Um, we're going to see uh, interesting things happen in the old uh, wet sun belt, uh, otherwise known as Dixieland. You know, I, I maintain that it's going to be, it's, once again, it will become an agricultural backwater um, uh, without universal air conditioning for everybody. You know, you're not going to have a metropolitan kind of uh, Dixieland, you know, Atlanta and Houston and all that. You can forget about it. Um, the, the, the large cities are going to contract substantially. And uh, many of them, of course, are already in a state of obvious failure, you know, Baltimore, Detroit, and then many more are now heading into the failure phase that uh, they, they had previously not been in. And uh, the places that are going to be valuable, uh, the places that are going to retain their value, be favorable places to make a life, are, are largely going to be the small towns, uh, the small towns that are, are uh, close to water transportation because the trucking industry is going to tank. And um, uh, that's what's going to happen. And we're going to have, uh, you know, tremendous so problems. Take a with... place like Baltimore, you mentioned yeah. Baltimore, and I happen yeah. to live here. Um, so we still have waterways. Yeah. We still have the infrastructure. That's, it's true. And, you know, our cities in uh, our cities everywhere, but, you know, especially our cities, the, the cities we're talking about in America, occupy important geographical sites. There's no question about it. Baltimore yeah. has a magnificent Yeah, yeah I wonder about this all the time. Like, what's wrong with Baltimore? Like, why can't we just get the shit going again? It's, got, it's gone through a phase of its existence that has made certain arrangements untenable. It's not going to be the yeah, skyscraper political. city of the, of the 1990s. It's yeah. going to be a smaller, more concentrated, lower city with a great harbor, and, uh, you know, there are other places that are still going to uh, function, but they may not flourish. New York City has the greatest harbor in, uh, on the East Coast, uh, but it has a tremendous problem. It's overburdened with skyscrapers and megastructures. We have learned since COVID-19 that you can't run skyscrapers economically at 30% occupancy if people are not going to offices to work. And yeah. now the trend is to not return to that model of corporate uh, behavior. And what that means is that, you know, an enormous amount of midtown Manhattan real estate has lost value. They can't cover their taxes, their maintenance and their uh, other costs um, on 30% occupancy or less. And New York City is going to be especially in trouble. It has basically attained a scale that uh, has no prospects for being able to carry on as it did in the 20th century. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time to build out Midtown Manhattan totally in skyscrapers. Okay, so we did it. Cheaper. It, huh? What if it just gets cheaper, like the market? Well, it doesn't mean that the behaviors will re return. And, and besides, you've got a whole list of other quandaries and problems that go with that one of them is that you know the infrastructure like the subway system subway system is already kind of falling apart now in new york city and um uh we're not going to be able to maintain it at the level of service that it had been and and even that was a very sketchy operation even at the height of the the early 2000s boom you know when when new york city was asset stripping the rest of america and all the money was flowing into wall street 
And, uh, you know, New York had gone through this magnificent renovation of all these old crappy neighborhoods. And we, but, you know, even then the subway system was in trouble. Now, with all that tax re revenue going away and people moving out, the middle and upper class people moving out of New York City and the, and the corporations either uh, 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 downsizing or quitting altogether their office leases, um, the tax revenue is going to be hugely reduced. And they're not going to be able to pay for their infrastructure to fix their water problems, their sewer problems, their uh, electric underground uh, 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 line problems, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a physically deteriorating city and a behaviorally deteriorating city, which we're already seeing with all of the terrible behavior that has gone on in the cities. And eventually it will be a much smaller city with a smaller population. There will be battles over who gets to retain the uh, ownership of the districts that still have value. And uh, some of them will be ethnic value, uh, battles. And, uh, you know, you'll see this all over America, although many cities are different. You know, I mean, a lot of the Western cities like Houston and, and uh, you know, Denver and Las Vegas, blah, 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 you know, they're largely suburban cities. And so they're going to uh, uh, combine the problems of suburbia with the problems of oversized uh, American metroplexes. And, and they'll be under you know, a different kind of pressure, but it will still be pressure to get smaller. And uh, you know, it's, it's gonna be very tough for these places. The, yeah, the places so what that does that mean, though? What does that mean for like the like the average person who's? That means you better think very clearly about where you're going to plant your flag to live. <laughs> where I'm, where I'm not kidding. Saratoga. No, I'm no. Not, I, I know you're not kidding. Well, I moved out of Saratoga. I was in Saratoga Springs, New York, which is 200 miles north of New York City. I was there for about 38 years, and uh, I moved a decade ago to. Uh, a little, uh, an old factory village 15 miles east on the other side of the Hudson River on a small tributary called the Battengill River, which has a lot of hydroelectric potential and used to have a lot of factories, but they're all gone now. And, um, you know, I, I planted my flag in a small town for now. And yeah. I, think, I think that's probably gonna be a decision that a lot of people will have wished they made. You know, our economy is gonna reorganize itself so severely and in ways that uh, are going to be unrecognizable to, to uh, people who expect the, the whole uh, 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 matrix of Disney World uh, uh, trucking, interstate highways, uh, suburban commuting, you know, all the things that are yeah, the, the one features of, the things, of our life. One of the things I've always liked about your work, Jim. Yeah. Sure. Is that you? Uh, you paint pictures. Paint pictures. Can you do that? You paint paintings. Of, I do. Of things that you think will not exist in like thirty years. Well, that's not. It's not solely what I'm doing, but you know, I'm. No, no, no. I find it fascinating, though, and I try to. the human imprint. Mind. It's the human imprint on the landscape, and I'm interested in yeah, it. Yeah. You know, I went to art school, and I've been in. I've been interested in painting for you know all my adult life, so that's what I do. But uh, you know, that's that's. Yeah, one. but I find it fascinating that the thing, like the one I tried to buy from you, and oh. you did not sell it to me oh, the mcdonald's one yeah the mcdonald's off of yeah. 87 yeah well yeah that's an old iconic painting and uh you know i could turn out more of them i could turn out more mcdonald's paintings i suppose yeah you told me that you would put your carhartt on but it was it, it had a hole in it that's what my you carhartt put. suit no, you're, yeah, the, I guess. The, no, that wasn't painted. That particular painting was not done in the winter. There was, a, there were a, a lot of, I paint what's called, uh, uh, the, the method I use is called sur le motif, which means upon the motif. You know, I paint from life. I go out there in yeah. whatever weather there is. And sometimes I have to dress very carefully for that. Sometimes I get rained on. 
And in the winter, sometimes it's really cold. So I wear mittens with a hole in the end to stick the yeah. paintbrush in. Uh, maybe that's it. Yeah, that's what it was. And, uh, you know, that's how I roll with that stuff. But I'm very interested. You know, I live in an area of industrial ruins. And what blows my mind is, you know, I went to uh, southern France for a couple of summers uh, back in 17 and 18. And uh, the place I stayed, uh, we used to go swimming in a great river, uh, uh, where there's a Roman aqueduct called the um, uh, Pont de Gard. And um, you swim under this magnificent structure that's as big as one of the New York City bridges. I mean, it's huge. It's, you know, the, the Romans were, were like the Flintstones on steroids. The things that they did with just human labor and no, you know, gasoline powered, diesel powered machines is just mind blowing. But anyway, that thing is still standing and people are still crossing the river on it 2000 years after it was built. Now I live in a town where there are railroad trestles that were built only 150 years ago so that are now in, a nearly total ruins. You know, there are factories that were built in the 20th century that are, you, there's nothing left but brick foundations. You know, there's less of our stuff that's 112 years old than there is of the Roman empire. What do you make of all that? Well, that, you know, that uh, um, the um, uh, fossil fuel age that I call the techno industrial age is an extremely ephemeral phase of history. To yeah. us, it's normative. You know, our parents grew into it, our, our grandparents grew into it, our parents lived their whole lives in it. And we are closer to the end than the middle. And um, it, all of that seems normal, hopping in the car and going to the supermarket, the supermarket, and, you know, going to the movies and turning on the air conditioner and doing all the things we consider normal. You know, those are really uh, extraordinarily anomalous, historically anomalous things to do and ways to behave. And it's, you know, it's all going to be going away. Now, luckily, we know that there are ways to behave that, uh, you know, there, there are other ways to behave that we can replace those things with. And we will, but we're not going to do it at the scale that we've been doing it at. And we're not going to do it in the WEF for, format of Klaus Schwab. Yeah, let's talk about him for a moment. <clears throat> yeah, well, the first question uh, it raises is who the hell does he think he is? Yeah. You know, with this little foundation, this little nonprofit NGO, you know, academic it's not, outfit. It's a little, it is okay. probably non, not nonprofit. Well, whatever it is, you know, I mean, it's it's an extra government, uh, extra governmental organization that has many pretensions about uh, uh, making plans for the whole world. It's really an amazing exercise in grandiosity as I see it. And in fact, grandiosity is one of the things that, that's characterized the end stage of this techno-industrial empire. What's um, the end stage? What's what, Well, what the end stage that? is that, you know, uh, yeah. the end stage is what we're in now, the long emergency in which the failures of all the subsystems ramify and worsen the failures of each other. So that, you know, you get a problem in the oil markets and the diesel fuel distribution, all of a sudden the trucking industry fall, fails. The trucking industry fails, all of a sudden there's nothing being delivered to the supermarkets. You know, all these things are interconnected and we assemble them this way, uh, you know, without reckoning that uh, they were, event that in the event of of failure, they were going to create enormous problems for themselves and for us. And that's what we're in now, this end stage. And one of the odd features of it that I'm mentioning right now is that because it's so spooky and people, it, it provokes so much anxiety in people, um, it tends to drive them towards grandiose, uh, fantastical thinking. So a lot of the things we're imagining are fantasies, like, you know, the idea that we're going to digitize all the money in the world. Uh, you know, that's, that's probably not going to happen. If they try to make it happen, it's going to create uh, not only an econ giant economic failure, but probably a political upheaval. Um, you know, another, another um, feature of this uh, 
end period of the techno industrial phase is what uh, Dr. Uh, Matthias Desmet of the University of Ghent calls mass formation psychosis, which uh, is a tendency for populations to arrange themselves into totalitarian societies because they're so full of anxiety and, and dread uh, and they're faced with fears and uh, of conditions that they just can't process. And that's what we're in, in, in this end stage of uh, the techno-industrial empire. And it's driven many people mad, but it has created a mass formation on the left of people who are now completely out of their minds. All right. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So yeah, I'm so sorry. I really even stuck no, in the old no. steamer trunk. You know what, Jim? I like talking to you because you're you're forthright about your ideas. Okay, point taken. <laughs> Stipulated. Yeah. So, what do you mean by the left is going crazy on this? And you, well, and I I started out by saying you use capital L, and I don't take you as a person who's particularly uh political so you mean something else when you i'm say very political i'm uh, very political i'm just i'm just caught as, in a i'm just caught in a major as shift as a lot of people that i know <laughs> well, but you're very particular just, about what you mean yeah well uh, you know i'm i'm looking at a uh, perhaps a bigger picture of you know economic dynamics psychological dynamics and uh you know, as well as uh, just one thing. Let let's start here because I think it was a it was a very good point. You said something. Uh, you said that you thought, ironically, Putin, Vladimir mm -hmm. Putin, was arguing. Um, I said he was a, he was probably a arguing western, he's a defender of western civilization in a way that nobody else understands it that's because we don't want to understand it we don't want to understand what he's doing you know i think that yeah. he does represent a defense of western civ although you know russia obviously is has been for a long time on the periphery of western civ sometimes uh leaning into it and sometimes leaning and away yet, from it here he is making that argument I would make that argument. I would also argue that Putin appears to be the most capable manager of his own country among the other managers of other countries in the world. Uh, but, you know, we're determined to just uh, we're just determined to smoke them. You know, we've got this obsession about having to smoke them. And so, you know, almost nothing you hear about, you know, Russia and Putin in American in, in all the news of, you know, the UK the U.S. and the other Western nations. None of that uh, tends to be true. Most of it is just BS. Well, do you fear um, in the face of like the WEF doctrine, do you fear uh, expressing your own point of view? Well, I'm, let's say I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, people who battle against the various narratives du jour are often attacked and disabled and canceled and ruined. But, uh, you know, I don't occupy any kind of university so post. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't occupy any teaching position in a, in a college, so I'm not afraid of having my job taken away. Well, you, you, know, you I, come from a good position, in, in my point of view, because um, you speak directly, and I've been reading a lot of your stuff. I, ha I have it right here. Um, which I just find refreshing because you're actually saying what you think. Well, not, not only that. How does look, that I, happen? How I'm does that happen? Far along I'm in the give world. You one credit is you wrote for Rolling Stone for a bit. Yeah, I worked for them for a while, and uh, yeah. you know that was the glamour job of my generation. And I went and did it. Didn't like it that much. Left, and that yeah. was exactly when I embarked on my uh ambition to become uh, a book writer you know and become you know when you were a young man in the 1970s so going back a while you know uh young men with literary ambitions wanted to write novels 
And that's exactly what I did. I dropped out finally of Rolling Stone. I figured I'd got as far in journalism as I was going to get. And I dropped out to write novels, went to a small town in upstate New York that was very congenial for that kind of life, Saratoga Springs, because it was in good shape. There were a lot of, you know, what we used to call shit jobs that you could do to support yourself while you were writing your novels. And I did all that. And I had a great time doing it. And I produced eight novels, didn't get rich. But then um, I was uh, uh, lured back into journalism by the New York Times Magazine, which had me writing a bunch of articles for them. And I turned one of them into a book proposal for uh, Simon & Schuster, which came out as The Geography of Nowhere, which was that, uh, that book about the fiasco of suburbia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what it was going to, what it was, the problems it posed for us as a living arrangement and uh, what we were going to do about it. And I wrote two more books about that stuff, but that led me directly to a consideration of, you know, how the, uh, the oil problem was going to eventually wreck uh, the fossil fuel, the whole fossil fuel economy that uh, we depended on. And that's where we are now. And we've been, you know, we've been in this uh, slow train wreck for uh, a couple of decades, and now it's really accelerating in a big way. Now the systems are really flying apart in a really dangerous way. So and, let's uh, let's uh, let's just ask the question. There's a bunch of money piled up in trust funds and shit like that 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 were compiled by that carbon era. Yep. And we know that uh, Mark Carney back in Glasgow is uh, COP26, like raised a shit ton of money, $130 trillion. Like, where is that money going? It's all going, in my opinion, to the regeneration of the world economy based on um, non-carbon that's where that's where people wish that it would go. You know, I know, but it's when I said when I, to some other thing. When I said earlier that this was, uh, you know, uh, an era fraught with grandiosity, it was. It's also fraught with wishful thinking. And in fact, I published a book in 2011 or 12, uh, which was called "Too Much Magic: Wishful Thinking, Technology, yeah, and the Fate of the Nation." And uh, so. The mere fact that people wish they could run Walt Disney World and the interstate highway system and suburbia by other means doesn't mean we're going to do it. It's a wish. It's a Jiminy Cricket syndrome. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. And it combines with that other American belief of recent years that it's possible to get something for nothing. So you combine those two. And when you wish upon a star, you can get something for nothing. That's the quandary that we're in. And you ask about those trillions of, of dollars of wealth that are out there. Uh, and your question well, is, where, does it, really where does it go? The, the real question is, does it, is it really there? And I, I would say to you, since most of, that, uh, most of that wealth in one way or another represents debts and obligations that people owe to one another and parties owe to one another that will never get paid, I would argue that that money isn't really there. It's a hallucination du jour, a hallucination of the moment. It's a figment. And that's exactly why so many people in the financial world are afraid of a really, uh, you know, king hell crash, because they know if the bond market uh, goes up in a vapor, you know, our money is going to disappear. We're going to be in a the most unbelievable deflationary depression that, that the world history ever saw because the money is just going to rush out of here into a black hole. And, uh, you know, and it will, of course, take the equity markets down with it as that occurs. But look at uh, here's one part of the dynamic I'm trying to describe, and I hope it's not too difficult for people to understand. But, you know, we were running this turbocharged uh, uh, fossil fuel empire, and I was chugging along. And then by about 2008, nine, with the, the, that great financial crash of the, of the day, it became obvious that we had a real problem with uh, the way uh, the financial system related to the real world of stuff on the ground and to the lives of real people. And um, uh, our financial authorities decided 
that instead of really facing the problem of what is the relationship between our supposed wealth and the stuff that's really there on the planet and, and us with it, instead of doing that, they decided to paper over the whole thing and play games with money and play games with instruments that represent money and represent other things and represent promises. And they managed to, to use that to keep the whole, uh, di the, the whole dynamic system running for another decade or so. And now they've run to the end of that string. They can't pretend anymore. They can't play any more games with the financial system. It's over. You know, it's coming, in, it's coming to that great reckoning that we hear about and have heard about for 30 that? years. I think it was, uh, well, it was actually originally, wasn't it James Goldsmith? Um, and then it became uh, Bill Bonner. And, uh, you know, right. it, I mean, it's an idea that thunders through through uh, our consciousness because we can see it. We know, we know that you can only mess around with reality for so long. So that's where we're at now. And, uh, you know, we're on the, the precipice of this uh, really world changing set of uh, failures and, and turbulence that goes with it. All right. So, well, if that's true, then why does the world continue? I mean, well, it's running it's on kind fumes, of biblical you know. in, in reference, but, but somehow you know society it's like the flywheel on an engine addison you know a flywheel is a great mass of metal that once it's set in motion the whole object of it is to keep things in motion generally yeah. uh you know uh through through uh the physics of momentum and that's what we're seeing with the systems that we've had but now they have they've all got a spanner in in the gears and they're all breaking slowing down stopping seizing up all at once and we're in the middle of it. And it's perfectly obvious to you when you look around and see it. And it's, you know, it is a gigantic, epic, historic train wreck of uh, e economy, culture, politics, and, uh, uh, you know, expectations. And it's kind of hard to take. You know, I, I can take it because I've been thinking about it hard for about 30 years. And I've been writing about it. And Writing about it gives you uh, the advantage of, of uh, having to actually work these ideas out in some way that at least appears to be coherent. So, yes. uh, you know, I'm satisfied with, with my interpretation of, of what I'm seeing and the fact that an awful lot of people agree with me. But, hey, look, at you know, I, you, we started out with, with uh, talking about the, uh, uh, you know, my attack on the left in capital letters, you know. What the left represents basically is anti-reality. Just about yeah, everything that I, they- that I actually wanted to bring that up. So that's good, go. Well, just about everything that they propose and believe, uh, you know, every so-called principle that they have is at odds with reality or isn't true, including a lot of the, you know, the popular ones, uh, uh, the kind of simple-minded ones that they're just, uh, using to punish the public, like forcing us to pretend that uh, men can be pregnant, you know, and, and then uh, punishing people who disagree with that. This is a, an insane mass formation Jacobin uh, uh, mindfuck. And uh, unfortunately, it is in the nature of mindfuckery that the people who get mindfuck don't understand that they are mindfucked. And that's what you've got out there. And that's why, you know, you can see absolutely contradictory ideas right in your face and they still uh, make their policy choices uh, in the face of those things. For example, it is now clearly established that the mRNA uh, COVID-19 vaccines don't work. We know that they don't work. People who take them are now more, even more susceptible to COVID-19 than the people who didn't take them. Uh, so we know they don't work. Moreover, there's a tremendous troubling record now of harms and injuries and disabilities and deaths that have been inflicted on people by these vaccines. And yet you still have the authorities in the Democratic Party run government promoting vaccinations. What could be more insane? And it be, it's beginning to look more and more like a 
you know, a deliberate attempt to murder the public. And, um, you know, I think personally that uh, the numbers are going to rise and people are going to be shocked. And even the many of the people who are in that psychotic mass formation uh, uh, and who have fallen for all of the narratives, you know, I think that uh, many of them are going to see what's actually happened. And there's going to be just a ferocious reaction to it. It feels to me like revolutions don't happen ferociously. I don't know. French Revolution was pretty ferocious. No, well, it took a while, though. It took 50 uh, years. I, I don't know. You know, uh, well, yeah, but the, the, when the revolution really got underway in 1789, you know, and... Uh, you know, oh, they, they went yeah. to the Bastille to let the, you know, the three or four prisoners who were in there out. Yeah, you know, one of the first things they did was point, one of the first things they did was cut off the head of the guy who was in charge of the Bastille. Things got pretty gnarly pretty fast. Yeah. And before you know it, you know, they're cutting off the heads of uh, an entire class of people. Yeah. And before you know it, you're in the middle of the Jacobin phase of the French Revolution, which is fairly late. You know, 1793, 94. It only lasted about 11 months. But these people did exactly what the Democratic Party is doing now. They turned French culture upside down with a lot of stupid ideas, like uh, changing the the changing the uh, the week from seven days to ten days. Yeah, they thought that was a good idea. Changing the calendar. You do fundamental things like that to people, they're going to start, you know, getting pissed off about it. So, uh, and in the process, they killed about 18,000 people. Uh, executed them. And uh, after 11 months of that nonsense, they were thrown out and their ideas were never entertained again until the Bolshevik Revolution. And now we're in it again, 100 years after the 100 odd years out of the Bolshevik Revolution, we've got the woke Marxist, you know, cultural revolution, uh, the, the Ivy League Maoist revolution in America. And it's preposterous. It's dishonoring and disgracing the people who were involved. You know, last week, the uh, Princeton University fired one of its best classics professors for uh, just about nothing. And the guy who runs Princeton University, Christopher Eisengruber, president, and all the deans who work there um, actually militated to get this guy bounced for no good reason. And these people are dishonoring and disgracing themselves and their institutions, and their institutions are going to pay. And the way they're going to pay is that higher ed is going to crumble and fall so fast it's going to make your head spin. All right, Jim. We good? Are we good? <laughs> Well, you know, you, it's going to take fortitude to get through this period of history. Yeah, this is a rough ride. I think that's actually true. I, I'm not disagreeing with you at, in any way. I'm just saying. And if you got uh, money, you got to be uh, careful about what you're going to do with it. Not just money, but uh, property. Like, what are what what are you going to do with your family too? I've got well kids. And, yeah. And they're getting exposed to the same kind of ideas at the same time. How old are they? Uh, well, I have one who's 22. And then I have, a, I guess he's almost 19. And then oh. I have a 16-year-old. So they're getting grown up pretty, pretty much. Yeah, they're getting grown up. But they're also, um, they're exposed to a lot of ideas that I don't, necessarily agree with yeah and they're and they're facing the prospect of an economy and a society that's not going to offer much to them in the way of uh you know a meaningful role to play in 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 life yeah. and uh, it doesn't mean kowtow to the whatever idea yeah although i'm not i'm not really convinced that that uh the the regime that's now in power is going to really remain there very long i think that they're you know, they're pissing off so many people that, you know, they're, I think their days are pretty numbered. But they, nonetheless, it doesn't mean that the other guys are better. Yeah, right. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean I, I do think that in this instance, they're arguably a little bit better. Uh, but the the opposition party, which is, you know, the right, the Republicans, you know, whatever you want to call them, they're very badly split right now, too. And uh, they have not 
emergently reorganized into some kind of a coherent uh, uh, opposition that really works. Uh, and it's a little hard to understand why exactly. I mean, why have the, you know, the, the so-called rhino faction of the Republicans uh, abetted the party of chaos, their, their opponents, the Democrats, but they have. And I, my guess would be that a lot of it has to do with corruption and money. But, uh, uh, you know, your kids uh, are, are of a generation who, of, of people who think, well, you know, maybe I'll be an investment banker or I'll be the marketing yeah, director you know, for the what's Gap or something. about the kids is that they're growing up in a time where they think that the old mores still apply but they don't so like the things that i try to teach them they're like oh yeah that's the way the world works but then when they go out into the world they it doesn't fit and mm -hmm. then they come back to me and they're like hey well that's not what they think and i go oh, well it, well there are so many it, insane yeah, right? I, there are so many insane ideas and and uh, ideologies out there right now that it would take an extraordinary uh, character for a young person to be able to really divine what, you know, what's real, what's, what's yeah, worth well, what's following. The difference, what's the difference between having an extra, extraordinary character and just being like, I don't really give a shit what they say and I'm going to do my own thing. Well, that's, that could be an extraordinary thing. People who follow their own principles and passions, you know, yeah. are to some extent extraordinary. You know, especially especially the ones who really know what they're doing. You know, the you can you can create a declen declension of how humanity is organized. Uh, you know, one way they're organized. There are people who know what they're doing, people who who uh, pretend to know what they're doing, people who don't know what they're doing at all. And uh, of course, the charismatic people are the people who uh, clearly know what they're doing. And um, uh you know <laughs> and then there's good luck <laughs> I, there are a lot of people look when I, i'm writing a book right now called young man blues about my own adolescence and post-adolescence and I, I floundered pretty badly in my early 20s myself uh, uh i graduated from college in 1971 and came into a world of uh, the uh, you know a nation that was in a sort of a recession it wasn't anything like today it wasn't nearly as disordered as today is but uh, i floundered i always wondered i mean i grew i mean i was born in 1968 mm -hmm. when you when you graduated college i was three years old yeah. but i i always like the the comparison for me is always back in uh like the nixon era the country was divided and people were doing things well, uh, was it, it like it, that? I mean, seriously, it was nothing. It was nothing like today. I mean, there were certain things that people still agreed about deeply. You know, the civil rights era was still pretty much underway. You know, we had just come. We were just, uh, you know, five, six years out from the great civil rights legislation of '63, '64, and uh, there was still a deep belief that. Yeah that we were going to correct the uh at least the structural problems of excluding people from mainstream life you know but but that too had interesting ramifications that we now see reverberating today for example you know if as i look back on the 1960s what i see is an interesting the birth of an interesting trend which is as soon as the civil rights legislation was passed um the black community begins to uh, uh, enter into a kind of agreement uh, among a certain portion of the black community that maybe they want to be separate. You know, maybe they don't want to be invited into mainstream American culture as, as the, the great fantasy of the, the uh, civil rights movement was. You know, maybe they want to be separate. Maybe they want to be, uh, have their own multicultural culture. And that leads us directly, you know, into the multiculturalism of the 70s and the 80s. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, uh, what's happened is that uh, the black community in America has become 
increasingly hostile and antagonistic to to uh, you know what had been the previously dominant culture, and you know to some degree they've gone on strike for thirty or forty years, and um, you know now uh, with Black Lives Matter, you know there, there's kind of a low grade uh, race war going out there with you know carjackings and uh, you know uh, theft, robbery, home invasion, you know all kinds of bad behavior. But, you know, you could see that beginning in the 1960s, and it was, unfortunately, it was worsened by the well-intentioned white liberals who, you know, decided that that multiculturalism was the bus that they wanted to hop on. And the fact of the matter is, if you don't live in a, in a country with a sturdy common culture in which yeah. values are consensually agreed upon, you know, you're not going to have much of a of a of a nation, and so yes. we're we're now in a broken nation without a common culture, and in fact, the party of chaos, which is now in charge, wants to make it even more broken. They try at every opportunity to break it some more, and that's one of the reasons that I am at war with them. Yeah, I mean that makes the emergency longer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's going to it's going to be harder and harder to resolve a lot of these things and they will be resolved probably emergently. That is to say, you know, the universe, the world is self-organizing. The behaviors are well, nonlinear. That's the things that you said is like we're uh, we're moving our way towards grace. Grace is going to have a way. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I so believe that, too, just so you know, like I'm saying. And I'm not religious, by the way. I'm not either. I, I just believe that um, the institutions that were developed, whatever, 270 years ago, are strong enough to let us resolve our issues. And I, and I also think philosophically, you know, there's, there, there's a very uh, worthwhile argument. And uh, Matthias uh, Desmet, uh, the author uh, of the new book on mass formation psychosis um, uh, discusses in the book about, um, you know, the, uh, the teleological nature of the universe, of yeah. the, 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 the universe having actually some purpose and meaning. Yeah, that but we it, are part of. the part of that is that the teleological nature is that we would end up in a good place. But there are a lot of people that mm -hmm. don't believe that. Well, right. And this is a period of tremendous turbulence. And uh, many ideas are unsettled and not. I mean, that's part of of having broken our common culture, which was so sturdy. You know, one of the peculiar things about COVID the COVID-19 years was because uh, I wasn't going anywhere at night. I was taking in a lot of Turner Classics movies on the boob yeah, tube. Yeah, interesting. Okay. And I was really observing how sturdy that culture was in the 1930s and 40s. And the agreement about everything, you know, about how everything works, you know, uh, manners, you know, everybody calls the, each other Mr. and Mrs., including the hobos. The hobos wear neckties. <laughs> you know, it's like they're dressing up in the but, morning to be. But hobos. don't you think? Don't you think there's a danger in just us being old white guys? I mean, like, no. That, I think there's an the accusation, accusation, and I think there's a bigger danger yeah. in us not uh, uh, realizing that we gotta, we gotta, you know, we we've grown a pair, and we're men, and we gotta act like men, and we've gotta be decisive, and we've gotta be fair and true, and we've gotta make distinctions between what is truthful what's beautiful and what's ugly and what's bullshit. And we are, too many of us are afraid to do that. You know, we've been coerced by this uh, Jacobin punishment machine that is the party of chaos. And I refuse to take it. So I'm attacking them as, and ridiculing them as much as possible. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, Jim, I like to read you.